Next up, uh, we have Eric Kazmenko giving a talk called Designing a Smartphone Dev Kit. Eric is a hardware engineer who has been working in the electronics industry just over four years. Where at two separate companies, he used KiCad as a prof on a professional basis. Currently, is working for Purism, helping them develop a smartphone that will run a, co a complete GNU Linux OS. Previously, he worked for several different startups that designed and manufacture consumer and industrial grade 3D printers, probably some you've heard of or used. Please welcome Eric to the stage. Hi, uh, I'm Eric Kazmenko. I'm the lead hardware engineer for Purism, and I led the hardware design for the Librem 5 dev kit. And today I'm going to be talking about my experience of going from the concept of the dev kit to its physical implementation. And up on the projection, you can see the 3D render of the dev kit and also a photo of one of the final units, which I have with me here. So you could take a look at that later. So when I started with Purism, we had just completed the crowdfunding campaign for the Librem 5. And in the campaign, we defined uh, the purpose for the dev kit. And we, we stated that the dev kit was intended to be used by software developers in order for them to prepare their software for the final smartphone release. Also in the campaign, we laid out some basic functionality that people who purchase the dev kit might expect them to have, like having a touch screen, a baseband modem, Wi-Fi, GPS, IMU, proc, sensors, uh, camera, and a wall wart to power it. So after the campaign ended, uh, we decided that we wanted to add some additional functionality to the dev kit in order to make it more conducive to being a sort of uh, smartphone uh, development platform, such as it being uh, battery powered, having a USB-C receptacle, mini HDMI, Ethernet, a 3.5 millimeter headset jack, uh, built-in speaker and microphone supporting micro SD cards, hardware kill switches for the uh, baseband modem, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and the camera and uh, microphone. Also a haptic motor for notifications and a few other things that we added. So early on, we ran into a sort of challenge that was the IMX 8M wasn't publicly available uh, after the campaign ended, and we really wanted to use it, and we were sort of in a state where we were in, be in between deciding to use the IMX 6 and the 8M. We really wanted to use the 8M because it's a more capable SOC, and it turned out that the 8M came out in early to mid-February of 2018, and so what, uh, what we decided to do early on was to use what's called a system on module that has the IMX 8M on it. Uh, we did this because we, we knew that the, the SOM designers had er early access to the IMX 8M, uh, like early revs of, of the silicon, and they also had uh, early access to its spec sheets. So we wanted to piggyback on that, uh, that, that early access that they had. So another reason why we chose to go with the SOM was because there was a potential for the, the SOM designer to review our baseboard design, and they could also help us with the PCB assembly. Uh, the majority of the SOM uh, production and sales happened around April of 2018. So once we figured out what the, the requirements were and the purpose was for the dev kit, we started to have to find the, the components that met those requirements. So, of course, uh, the most important of which was the SOM that we used, and we ended up uh, going with MCraft's SOM uh, because of their responsiveness and the communication that we had with them, and also they were really eager to work with us. Uh, their SOM also has this uh, kind of unique feature where uh, it allows you to place components underneath the SOM because it's it's spaced up off of the baseboard. So that allowed us to maximize the, the real estate of our board. Also, their, their evaluation board that they had, their, their baseboard was a pretty useful reference for us because it, it shared some, some peripherals that our dev kit had, like USB-C and uh, HDMI. 
We also have a connection with a German supplier that helped us identify the specific IMU and PROC sensor that we use because they gave us a pretty good deal on that. Uh, also, the charge controller was selected based on its under voltage, over voltage, and over current protection that it has built in for the, the battery that we use. Uh, also, we wanted it to be able to do things like have uh, USB VBUS roll switching, so be able to set the set it as either a source or sync in an I squared C register. So uh, we selected the Wi-Fi module based on whether it could load its own firmware. The reason why that was a requirement was because PureOS, the, the operating system that uh, we develop, uh, it's, it's uh, GNU, GNU Linux, um, it, it, need, it needs to be completely free of any binary blob, so we couldn't have uh, PureOS touch the that firmware. Uh, it also, we also required that the Wi-Fi module support SDIO rather than PCIe, which is less power efficient. The MP, MPCIe baseband modem module that we picked, uh, we based that on uh, whether it would support I2S or PCM audio interface uh, for voice calls, which for obvious reasons because we're developing a smartphone, uh, and also based on the number of bands that it supports because we want to support the most number of regions possible. The rest of the components were picked based on things like their size, their power consumption, their price, and if their spec sheets explicitly state uh, mobile applications. Uh, like for example, the, the LED driver that we use uh, st states that it's an, it can be used as a LCD backlight boost converter. So when the IC that you're looking at specifically calls out the application you're uh, intending to use it and then there's a good chance it'll work and you can delve farther into the, the data sheet to see if it works for you. So after picking most of the critical components, we started drawing the schematic and of course not all of the, the ICs had symbols in, uh, in KiCad's official libraries. So we created our own library and drew, drew the symbols that were missing and put them in there. A lot of the component selection was done concurrently with the schematic capture. This was done because uh, it helped us like keep the ball rolling. Like for example, when we would draw the uh, when we would be ready to draw the audio subsystem, we know that all right. Well, we have to pick the audio codec to to finish this. So, so that that um, was the it was the best way to 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 keep the design going. So, the the structure of the schematic is, so you can see here, it's, it's such that the top level sheet is a sort of block diagram. And the big thing in the middle here is, uh, it represents the SOM. And the, the four pillars on the corners are like the four connectors of the SOM. And you can see the, the hierarchical sheet boxes and how they connect to the, the connectors. So you can sort of tell uh, what goes where. Here you'd have to like zoom in to see what's what. Uh, so one thing that we did each for for each day that we drew this, the schematic at the end of the day we would uh, check to make sure. Oh, the resolution on this sucks. Uh, so <laughs> there. So we we checked to, to see if the uh, ERC would pass, and it still does. So so basically, when, once we were done. Uh, working for the day, we, we would want to make sure that there weren't any regressions when we would pick up, off the, uh, pick up the next day. Another thing we did was we simulated the, um, the headphone jack uh, switch circuit in using a, uh, a circuit simulation kernel called Zeiss in a program called Quux. The reason why we did that rather than using NG Spice inside of KiCad was because uh, there were some copyright issues with uh, using NG Spice at the time, but that's a topic for a different discussion. So, oh. so after uh, finishing the schematic, we had to create footprints for all of the the components. Uh, most of the components we we grabbed existing footprints in KiCad's libraries, and we just adjusted things like the pad dimensions, their position, their pitch, uh, and like the solder mask based on what the 
manufacturer would recommend in their spec sheets. Uh, we did something kind of interesting with the, with the footprints. We, for the SOM, we uh, drew a sort of outline. We, we grabbed this, this photo of MCraft SOM from their website and we, and we drew a uh, outline of where there are components and traces on the back of it. So here's a 3D render of it. And the reason we did this is so that we could tell where, where we could stick tall components like tantalum caps and uh, inductors that could be noisy and interfere with the stuff on the back. So this allowed us to see wh where we could pl place those components. So we also added 3D models for just about every component in the design. There you can see a little 3D render of the USB-C receptacle. Uh, so after creating all the footprints, we started to do the floor planning and uh, drew the outline of the board. We placed the, all of the receptacles at the bottom. You can see it. And the reason we did that was because that's where it made the most sense. That's where smartphones usually have uh, like their USB and uh, HDMI, things like that. So we, we placed the SOM in the direct center of the board. Uh, and we ended up rotating it 180 degrees from where we initially put it because of the proximity of the, the, its connectors to what peripherals it would end up being routed to. The antennas were placed at the top of the board because that's where it made the most sense for them to go. And of course the, the baseband modem module, the uh, Wi-Fi module, and the, the GPS module were placed near their respective antennas. Uh, the 18650 lithium ion battery holder was placed in between, you can see it here, it was placed in between the receptacles and the SOM because that's where there was room and also because the battery holder had to be, uh, it had to be near the charge controller and the charge controller had to be somewhat close to the uh, USB-C receptacle and, and the charge controller actually ended up being underneath the SOM. So that's where it made the most sense to place the holder. So uh, after, after the uh, floor planning, we started to do, to really crank out on the layout. We used the ICs, uh, the various ICs data sheets um, whenever they would have uh, a layout uh, recommendation in there, we would, we would use that as our reference. Um, otherwise, sometimes they'll have uh, an evaluation board with Gerbers that you can use to, as, as uh, your reference, like for example, a, there might be a, a regulator that sh that'll show you how to place the passive components around it. You can use that as a reference. So when we started, we started with 1,727 unrouted nets and we managed to get it down to zero. It was a six layer board and for reference, MCraft's uh, baseboard that we used as a sort of uh, reference was eight layers. So we managed to do two less. Um, early on in the layout, KiCad 5.0 came out this was around when we finished uh, the routing uh, USB 3 and uh, the charge controller circuit. And um, that, that migration wasn't too difficult for us. It took us like a couple of days to do it. Uh, the bulk of the layout took about two months. We did it from June to August. And we route, uh, when we started, we routed most of the, the critical impedance controlled nets first, like uh, the USB 3.0, HDMI, Ethernet. MIPI DSI and CSI diff pairs. And we did, we did the, uh, the analog domain stuff after that, like the, uh, the audio codec, the built-in speaker and mic, the class D op amp, things like that. Uh, then it turned out at the very end, we, we laid out the, um, the baseband modem um, antenna at, at the very end. This was because we, we, it was a sort of a chicken and egg problem where we didn't know how much room we would have, but at the same time to select it, we would have to know what amount of room we, we, we would have uh, for the antenna. And we sort of got lucky and found this one that was actually released in, in 2018 that, that fit in our layout and yeah, it, it works pretty well. So some layout or some uh, useful layout references that we used while laying out the board include Toradex's layout design guide. The reason why we referenced this was 
because it includes information about like the amount of uh, skew that you could tolerate for certain interfaces, like um, like for for MIPI or uh, Ethernet or USB 3.0 things like that, and it'll tell you what the best way is to 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 route um, to add uh, ser serpentine bends in in your traces in order to to minimize the skew. We also reference Texas Instruments high speed interface layout guidelines. The reason why we referenced uh, this was because it includes information about like how you should space your how far you should space your diff pairs so that uh, you don't have any crosstalk between them. And uh, we also used IMX, or NXP's IMX ADEM hardware developer, developer's guide for obvious reasons, because we were using that SOC. Uh, we also uh, took a look at Yeon Yoon's paper, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, his paper titled, A New Formula for Effective Dielectric Constant in Multi-Dielectric Layer Microstrip Structure. The reason why we referenced his paper was because um, the the antenna feed lines are microstrip feed lines that have that they're routed on the the top layer, and they use the bottom layer as their uh, ground reference plane. And like I said before, it's a six-layer board, so there's like a sort of complex sandwich of uh, different thickness uh, substrates with different relative permittivities. So we wanted to figure out what's the, what's the effective relative permittivity of that whole stack up. And so that, that's uh, how we figured that out. We also used KiCad's built-in transmission line calculator to uh, figure out the dimensions for all of the controlled impedance lines throughout the board. And so after completing the layout, we exported the Gerbers in preparation for prototyping them, uh, prototyping the dev kit. And so we had some back and forth communication with the PCB fab that we were going to go with. And they would send us uh, engineering queries asking, like, is it OK for us to, um, to combine the solder mask on like a fine pitched uh, uh, footprint, or like if it's OK to have um, burrs on a pad that's near the, the edge of the board, or things like that. So after going through a few iterations of that EQ process, we are ready for production of the, at least for the prototypes, right? Um, but unfortunately, we had several delays from this fab in China. It was too much for us to tolerate, and we ended up going with a domestic fab instead. Uh, and we had them produce 10 prototype units, which we had assembled in Carlsbad, California. And our uh, Librem 5 team received their their prototype dev kit units in early October, and we tested them for about a month. So uh, after, te after testing the prototypes, of course, there were failures. And this is the slide where I have to repent for my design sins that I've made. So uh, I just wanted to say that everybody makes mistakes. Everybody, sh everybody uh, and uh, failure is a critical part of engineering. If you're, if you're not having failures, then you're probably not doing anything at all. So with the prototypes, uh, the mini HDMI receptacle was mistakenly routed as a standard HDMI, which uh, actually surprisingly worked with one of the monitors that we tested it with. What was happening was the, uh, so the, the positive side of the diff pair was connected to the shielding of the uh, HDMI. And the negative side was correct. So even though the signal was squenched by half, it was, uh, it, the monitor was still able to pick up the image. So that was pretty crazy. Uh, also, the prototypes uh, used an M.2 socket that was too low of profile for the uh, Wi-Fi modem. I mean, uh, sorry, the Wi-Fi module. And what would happen is if you, um, if, if you insert the, the Wi-Fi module into the socket, it would raise up at an angle. That's because the, the Wi-Fi module has components on the back of it, so the, the connector had to be a little bit taller. Uh, the synchronous audio interface 5 for the Bluetooth uh, mistakenly has the bit clock and the word line swapped. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to test the Bluetooth audio interface um, on the prototype, so that managed to slip through the cracks and 
was that mistakes in the final units. So if you got one, I'm sorry. Uh, we so I, I actually created an issue in our internal GitLab that points the the specific commit where uh, I, I made that mistake. It happened around um, when we picked the, the Wi-Fi module. It, it was the, the hierarchical, you can see it up there, it's the hierarchical uh, block that had them swapped. So of course, after prototyping, we, f we fixed all the mistakes that we were able to catch, and uh, we ended up, so we sent, we sent them out to be fabbed again, uh, at a, this time at a different place. We ended up making about 340 units, and we managed to ship out all of the, the backer units before December 23rd, and some people got theirs before Christmas, which was awesome. It was pretty intense. Uh, so one thing that happened when we shipped out the dev kits is that the uh, LCD panels weren't displaying the, their image correctly, and it turns out that the cause was because of an IMX item uh, silicon errata, and we, so what was happening was we weren't able to initialize our panel using um, the MIPI DSI uh, low power mode, and we were able to work around it by using uh, MIPI DSI's high speed mode instead. So uh, we, we published a patch in February. So if you have a dev kit and you update your software, that problem will be fixed. So. We did the entire design uh, in Git as our revision control system, and using Git was extremely important for, for us in this project. Uh, it allowed us to do things like uh, go back and forth between the head commit and an earlier commit to see, uh, like, for example, if, there was, uh, if the design was failing ERC or DRC for whatever reason, and we, we couldn't figure out why like if the errors weren't letting us figure out why, we, uh, we could go back to an earlier commit and see what changed. In total, there were 551 commits. Um, at one point, we were trying to decide between using an MPCIE baseband modem and an M.2 baseband modem. And uh, at this stage, what we did was we created a new branch in Git that had, it set as, had the design set as an MPCIE baseband modem. And when we finally made the decision to use the MPCIE one, we merged that into master, and that was then our, uh, that was what we were gonna go with. So uh, during the design, I collaborated with uh, another hardware engineer in Germany. Uh, he was, of course, also using Git, and when I would be asleep, he would work, and when he would be asleep, I would work because of the time difference, and we wouldn't have any uh, Git conflicts, so it was, it was actually pretty convenient that way. Um, we didn't have to do silly things like uh, zip up the project in an, in an archive and send it over email. So using Git was really convenient. Like we, we could just pick up where the last person left off in Git. Uh, so one thing that we did early on was we switched from GOGS to GitLab as our internal um, uh, Git host. And the migration for that was, wasn't difficult at all. It was pretty straightforward. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> the, so what we did was... Uh, we just created a new remote and used the, the new repo and uh, pushed all of our changes to there. So at the bottom, you can see the, uh, the URL for the, our, our Git repo that has the whole hardware project in there. You can clone that, take a look at it, let me know what you think. So, yep, that's all for my talk. Thank you for your time and attention.